It was a detente on two fronts as President Trump reopened talks with China on trade and North Korea on denuclearization, a last-minute meeting with Kim Jong-un lasting one hour and resulting in an agreement to restart negotiations that abruptly ended in Hanoi in February. After a handshake, Mr. Trump became the first sitting president to set foot in North Korea. The relationship that we've developed has, uh, has meant so much to so many people. And it's just an honor to be with you. And it was an honor that you asked me to step over that line. And I was proud to step over the line. I thought you might do that. I wasn't sure. But I was ready to do it. And I want to thank you. It's been great. It's been great. Very historic. China's President Xi Jinping had visited Chairman Kim earlier in the week before sitting down with Trump at the G20, a meeting itself that produced its own temporary ceasefire on trade. We will be continuing to negotiate, and I promise that uh, for at least the time being, we're not going to be lifting tariffs on China. We're going to work with China on where we left off to see if we can make a deal. As part of this truce, China will buy more farm products from the U.S., and Washington will grant Huawei licenses to do business in the U.S., no new tariffs will come on, but all tariffs that are currently in place will stay. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross told me the Huawei licenses will be approved very soon and that the truce will last for as long as talks are going well. President Trump, Andrew, says he is not rushed on China and also says that North Korea negotiations could restart in the next two to three weeks. Hey, Kayla. Um Let's talk a little bit about the Huawei situation because it affects so many different U.S. suppliers to Huawei, uh, big tech companies, of course, Micron, uh, the Qualcomm's and ch the chip makers of the world, but also the Googles of the world that were providing Android, uh, the Android operating system uh, to it. Obviously, uh, for many, many uh, months now, uh, the president has said that it is a national security threat. Uh, it appears to have been no longer a security threat. Is that change? Is there something else to this? Uh, Larry Kudlow was on television yesterday saying that all the specifics hadn't necessarily been worked out or at least hadn't been disclosed. Is there something else we're going to learn about how this has been constructed? Well, the administration is trying to talk about it in a temporary way, Andrew. They say we're not going to deal with Huawei until the very end of these negotiations. And it seems that these licenses are a way to sort of have their cake and eat it, too. They can allow Huawei to do business and offer that to China as a sign of good faith in these negotiations while still reserving the right uh, to keep these restrictions on Huawei long term. Huawei will stay on the business blacklist. I think the administration is also going to be running into some opposition from Capitol Hill. Senator Marco Rubio tweeted yesterday. Uh, that that Congress would put re new restrictions on companies like Huawei and ZTE if the administration is going to roll them back. He says that the Senate has a veto-proof majority on this, and we'll see whether any of those efforts come to fruition in the meantime. I think part of it also has to do with the different branches of Huawei. Is there a way to kind of split the difference and say, okay, you can continue to do things when it's for consumers, when it's for handsets, for, for mobile phones, but right. it, it may be a different situation when you're talking about some of the more sophisticated telecom equipment that, that's used to uh, put together 5G networks and things. But even on that front, Becky, there has been some concern within the administration that uh, some rural networks in Wyoming and in the Pacific Northwest have already made some purchases of these Huawei parts for their broadband networks. And they want to make sure that rural America can get access to this Internet uh, using the, the affordable parts that they've already bought. Uh, so I know that there's, there's some hand-wringing over that as well, and maybe there's a way to solve this where you say any business that's been done in the past can still go forward, anything from here on out cannot. Uh, but again, a lot of those details we're still waiting to hear. I mean, it's something worth paying attention to in the markets today because the different chip makers manufacture for different parts of this. I think Qualcomm is a big chip maker for the consumer handsets. You've got other companies like Xilinx that make some of these other parts. So it'll be something to watch in the markets as it plays out today, too. Walk us through a little bit of the calendar now in terms of how these negotiations you imagine can play out. How does this work? What are the permutations? Well, the president says he's in no rush, and we don't know exactly when this next round of negotiations will take place. We know this truce is open-ended. That was something that his top trade official, Ambassador Robert Lighthizer, had been pushing for. He didn't want to be hamstrung by what he feels are, are artificial deadlines here. Uh, the expectation uh, 
when talks break, broke down before uh, was that the U.S. delegation would be traveling to Beijing next. China places a lot of significance on uh, these talks being equitable, the same number of negotiations on either side. So the ball is in the U.S.'s court to go to Beijing uh, to hold a next round of negotiations. We don't know exactly when that would take place, but that's the next thing that we're watching for.